the Alt L1 rotation and getting a newer, faster L1, it's not going to go away. It's going to be the same thing in two years. It's like the simplest and most attractive investment for people in size. About an ecosystem, what do you do? You go by Sol or you go by ETH. And they are getting faster and better every single time. So great. Like they're pushing the tech forward. Solana's like not going to go away. And like there will be similar chains like that that are like relevant and have like this big general purpose um, execution and community around it. And then I do think that there will be like a ton of rollups and L2s. But you will still have that just like very strong mix of architectures in my mind. All right, everyone, this episode is brought to you by Monad, an L1 bringing performance to the EVM with parallel execution and both a custom consensus engine and new database solution. You'll hear more about them later in the show. Before we get moving on today's episode, just a quick disclaimer. The views expressed on this podcast by either myself, my co-host, or any guests are their personal views and do not represent the views of any associated organization. Nothing in the episode should be construed or relied upon as financial, technical, tax, legal, or any other advice. Okay, let's jump into the episode. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Lightspeed. We are doing another roundup, but with a twist this week. We have John Charbonneau joining us and excited to kind of dive into the latest happenings this week. It was an exciting week in Solana land. A lot of things were going on, um, and that's not to leave Ethereum out either. We uh, we have e- EIP4844, the Denkun upgrade, going live tomorrow. Um, and we get the the pleasure of making predictions the day before during the recording with the episode going live the day after. Uh, so this will be airing on the Thursday. We're recording on the Tuesday. So do keep that in mind when we get to that section. Uh, but I uh, I think with good jumping off point here is is Jito. Um, so last Friday, the team announced there that the uh, Jito Labs will be choosing to suspend the mempool offered through the Jito block engine due to the negative externalities that were impacting Solana users. So there's a lot to unpack with this, but I honestly think a good jumping off point would uh, maybe, Murd, I'll throw it to you. If you want to just explain from a high-level overview of like what G- the decision in, uh, change of, in terms of the, the Jito block engine, um, and then there's two pieces I want to dive into. So A, what those negative ex- externalities are that they described, and then B, like who are the users that, are re- that we're like, really trying to protect here? Like What are those users doing? What are they, you know, how are they interacting with the chain? And kind of go into those two things. So yeah, I'll throw it over to you to give like a high-level overview of really what changed with the the Gito Labs engine. Sure, yeah. So I think most people are familiar with Ethereum and how it works and you send a transaction, it goes to this mempool and then uh, people like searchers might reorder some of those transactions in some way and extract some profit or maximize their profit that they can make. Uh, Jared from Subway, you might have heard, uh, is, is, is quite good at doing this and is a major source of fees for Ethereum right now. On Solana, you don't have a mempool uh, by default. It's actually basically the blocks are built continuously, so like they're streamed basically. Um, and Jito basically has said, well, they added a discrete au- discrete auction process to this to this mix, and they have they literally added a mempool um, to uh, the Solana client. They forked the Solana client, and so now the same types of MMV attacks that were possible on Ethereum. Are basically uh, or were available on Solana, uh, but the ecosystem wasn't as evolved as the Ethereum MEV ecosystem, right? Like there wasn't like uh, RPCs with like private MEV protection. Um, people, especially the users, aren't as sophisticated, right? Like most of them don't even really know what slippage is. These Telegram bots have like 99% slippage ratings, um, and I'm not kidding, by the way. Like some of them have crazy slippage ratings, um, and like for example, uh, to the to the look, like, listeners who are unfamiliar with what this would look like, you can just imagine like uh, you place a market order to buy something, uh, and somebody's watching you. Um, they can like drive the price of that up uh, so that you buy at a higher price, and then they can just sell it after and profit from that price swing because you know that's uh, you know there's probably poor liquidity and your slippage is probably pretty high for the market order. Um, and so this was happening quite a bit on G, uh, on Solana due to the recent meme coin season, right? Like there's hundreds of coins being launched and people are just buying and selling and trading a bunch of shit all the time. And that gives searchers who have this like edge because um, they, they, they obviously have this mempool. They can see what's, what's, what's happening. And they were giving users very um, basically the worst possible price possible that you set. Like if you said my slippage is going to be twenty five percent, like that's the worst I'll accept. You would just get that, like it basically was guaranteed. 
And so the users would be getting worse prices while these bots would be getting, you know, more money. And obviously the DeFi protocols uh, were not happy with this. Um, and, you know, I think there was some social pressure. Uh, I've seen quite a few things on on Twitter calling Jito out, even though I really don't think they should have been called out at all. They were building this in the open for two years now, but that's another topic. And so last Friday, they decided to shut down the mempool so that users aren't affected. Um, so yeah, that's that's a little context. I'll kind of pass it over to John for for his thoughts on this. Yeah, it, like it, it was definitely interesting to watch play out because it, it was funny. I think it was like one or two days before they announced that. I had actually, I listened to the weekly roundup that you guys did the week before. And like I quote tweeted it. I was like, this conversation sounds like really familiar if you've like if you followed Ethereum MEV for the last like few years. It was like the exact same things you heard like two years ago of like, all right, like there's a problem and like at least we democratize the MEV rather than like send it to like some centralized party, like it funds the network, like Gito's like doing a good job, like they're a good team that's like running this. Um, like all things considered, it's like the best kind of thing. Um, it, like it, so it was just like really ironic to me to see like one or two days later. And then I was like, all right, never mind. We're going to take the exact opposite of approach of Ethereum and just like see what happens with it. Um, so I like I, I was I was a little bit surprised when I saw it, I guess, at first, um, even though like I guess I shouldn't have been like it was clearly something that was being considered. Um, I, like my, my first reaction was more in the direction of like, I don't think that this is worth doing. Um, cause I think that, like, I think that everyone knows this is obviously like not a sustainable outcome of like, th this is like not going to hold up indefinitely. Um, the more that I thought about it, like, I, I do think that this probably is the right decision for them, like particularly like just at this current point in time with Solana's development and like the way that the ecosystem looks, um, like, like it is still a very different like situation than Ethereum. And like, you actually had a very good tweet about this. Um, it mostly pointing out the fact that I do think that this will basically hold longer than it would have if someone tried to do something like this in Ethereum, um, just by the simple nature of the fact that it is going to be much harder for someone to go spin up a Jito like fork slash competitor or whatever to go recreate this thing than it would have been on Ethereum when we're already in this situation. We're like, all right, like we already have the public mempool. Like this is kind of how everyone's used to operating. Like there's a lot more people working around the space. Like quite frankly here, it's like not easy for someone to like just go recreate the Jito Solana mempool and like, and then get the social kind of complexity solved of like getting enough people to like onboard onto this thing to start to use it in the first place. Um, so my assumption is like, this is not a stable equilibrium of like at some point, like if you just like look at the numbers, obviously there is a lot of money that's being left on the table now. Like, like even I was surprised by it. Like when I looked at the dashboards, like the day that they announced it, um, like, like I tweeted out uh, of like the current run rate at that point was like there was 10K a day in Seoul um, in tips, which is like a million and a half dollars. So this is over a billion, half, over, over half a billion dollars a year, at least like annualized, like at least at that run rate um, that was going through the auctions. Like it's a lot of money. Um, so not all of that is obviously removed with getting rid of the mempool, but like it points to the right order of magnitude. There's a high incentive for someone else to go spin something like this up over a long enough period of time and to like try to capture that value themselves. Um, this does just buy you like so much time, at least in the short term, that it is enough that it's probably worth it. Um, and then in that interim, you start to think about like, okay, like what is the better long run solution? Um, and, and this is where it starts to get tricky, um, because this is where you start to like have the same conversations again that Ethereum had like a couple of years ago. It's like, okay, like what are some of the things that we think of as like the possible solutions to like, we could add a mempool back, but like you keep it more private and you kind of like auction this off to a permission set of like fillers, you know, something that's like more like either looks like, like Mev share or, or like Uniswap back something more in that direction of like, okay, like we trust the parties that we're going to send this to. So like, they're not going to sandwich and screw all the users, or you start to do something more like a full block PBS and like you have a private mempool with that. Um, so it's not a perfect solution. And that's why it's like, like this is not going to hold, but it like, it probably buys enough time and saves like enough value. And like in the Solana ecosystem, that it's also just worth trying the experiment right now. Um, like there is much more social cohesion, I would say, like within the Solana validator set compared to Ethereum. Of like, um, it is just like just as a byproduct of kind of like who owns a lot of the soul. Quite frankly, of like it's still held at least relative to Ethereum, much more heavily concentrated among like investors and the foundation that's like delegating stuff like that. So like you can actually just kind of direct like at least a large portion of the stake that makes it easier to control at a high level. Um, but 
it is still the same idea of like, you know, someone is incentivized if they're running like 5% of stake or whatever, some small amount to like, go start doing this on the side. Like if your validators like start searching on your own um, or start like striking these agreements out of band. So how long this will hold, like no idea, um, but it'll be a fun experiment to see like if nothing else. Yeah, I think that's well said. I think the thing that um, mo most people, I think the first in initial reaction was like the incentive is to now boot like this and uh, maybe fork it or something, but then because maybe pattern matching from Ethereum, but this is actually a very difficult technical challenge. Like Jito did, took a very long time to do this and the code is, uh, the, the labs client is, you know, <laughs> pretty hard to read. Uh, and uh, so somebody would have to understand how Solana works at a very deep core level and then get like basically half the validators to adopt this new client. And it took Jito a very long time to do this. And so it, it's actually like a business that's quite hard to compete with. So that's interesting. Um, I, I would be very interested to see if there's competitors that rise up in the next few months to years based on the amount of money that's on the table right now. The other thing that makes this interesting is actually, I think, the Fire Dancer clients. Because once Fire Dancer goes live, um, and let's say it's like a, I don't know, let's say it's a 10x improvement over the client, uh, the lab's client, are validators now going to run this? Or are they going to run Jito, assuming Jito runs the, uh, the 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 mempool back, right? Like, which one do you use? Does Jito now add a uh, mempool to the Fire Dancer clients, right? There's a lot of really difficult questions here. And um, this is all coupled with the fact that the fees actually basically don't work right now. And there's network jitter. And so there's a lot of uh, fun problems that are... And, and like, I tweeted this the other day, which was like, you know, Solana's working this fast and it's like insanely broken. So like, I'm, I'm kind of curious what happens to L1 scaling when these problems are actually fixed. Like, what does that look like? Okay, guys, quick break from the episode to talk to you about Monad, the L1 optimizing the performance of the EVM. The team is working to materially advance the efficient frontier in the trade-off between decentralization and scalability. The internal devnet is currently live and public testnet is coming soon. And testing on the internal devnet uh, indicates that the chain can handle up to about 10,000 transactions per second, significantly increasing the throughput capabilities of the EVM. This, of course, opens doors for new applications and more interesting use cases, even those with greater complexity and higher usage, to run in a decentralized manner. Importantly, Monad is fully compatible with the EVM and the Ethereum RPC API, which provides EVM developers with the seamless portability for their applications. Given the popularity of the EVM today, this is really a no-brainer. To stay up to date with all of the latest developments, join the Monad community by following them on Twitter and jumping in the Discord. They're a lively bunch, so hit the links in the description below. All right, let's get back to the episode. Dan, I believe you had a question. Yeah, no, that, that's funny. I think actually, uh, out of pure chance, like the three of us kind of immediately all went to the same direction of like, oh, the incentives are now there for someone else to take advantage of this. And um, it was interesting because most of crypto Twitter definitely went to the the opposite direction. It's like, oh, no, this is the, the better end state. But what I still am like struggling to get my head around is like, you know, I, I've I pay attention to this industry for long enough that I'm going to dabble in some meme coins here and there. It's just, I, I can't not. And so when I make trades to, to purchase any meme coin, I know I have full understanding. I, I guess maybe I'm an outlier here because I have full understanding of when I set slippage to 10 plus percent, like I'm just going to get nailed. Um, but like I'm buying this thing because of the, the potential price appreciation to see if we can make a quick trade, right? That, like that's the whole point. And it is very much so gambling. Um, and so if I'm like using a Telegram bot or something, like I, like I don't know, I struggle to think that like that is the user that really we should be prioritizing here. Now, if you abstract all of that away and you just think high level, should users be getting better or worse prices? It's like fundamentally the answer is absolutely a better price. Like I, I don't think we should be creating systems to, um, you know, that end up negatively imp impacting users, or you won't have users for much longer after that. That does seem fairly true. Um, so it's like this weird push and pull for sure. Now, I, I, the question is, I guess, how long does this go on for? Because John, to your point, you know, half billion dollars a year sitting on the table, you know, you throw tokens incentives plus this MEV potential at some validators and like people, people will switch, you would think. However, Jito was pretty loud about the fact that, you know, everybody, all the validators in their circle and all the searchers were, you know, applauding them for doing this because ultimately they're thinking long term, not short term. And that's, that's hard to do in any industry, let alone this one, where the incentives tend to be very, very short-term um, uh, 
uh, focused. So I think that's an interesting plus there as well is, you know, we do have the right people building it, which I think we kind of hit on in, in last week's episode as well. The question is like for now is like, MEV is a very unsolved problem in, in Ethereum land in all of this industry. And what if this, like the social layer actually is the answer? And it's like this weird backwards world where we build all of these engineering systems, but the end of the day, like the only way you can prevent this one thing that nobody can, the, the nut that nobody can cr- crack is saying, hey, this is bad for our users. And like, you know, maybe as the dApp or the wallet, if you see a validator, you know, sandwiching users or whatever, you'll like skip that leader or something like that. Like, I'm curious if you guys have any thoughts around like maybe taking the social aspect one step further and not just saying, hey, it's bad, uh, but actually like holding off sending order flow to leaders uh, that are like participating in this, you know, what's considered bad MEV. And I guess that's kind of possible because with four millisecond slots and the leader holding what, four concurrent slots, then, you know, you just wait a couple seconds and you're not, you're going to get that better price. It kind of seems like it'd be a good trade-off. So maybe John, I'll throw that to you. Curious if you have any thoughts there. So in general, I think that the like social layer approach to MEV, I, I think is like completely valid and is actually probably how MEV will be addressed in most circumstances in the long run. Um, the thing that is just like fundamentally super, super difficult is I don't know that that is going to work super well when you're talking about like a completely general purpose and trying to be like maximally decentralized type of system that like wants to have very decentralized ownership and permissionless and like very unopinionated about like running the network. Um, so like this works in a Cosmos chain where you have like more concentrated ownership and you know there's like a double digit number of validators because it's like yeah like we know all the guys who are running this and like there's a handful of people who are like running this and, like we understand like all right like if someone tries to screw me it's like hey like I know that guy like we're in the same Telegram group chat like we're gonna kick you out of the chain like that like, like that makes sense um, when you're trying to do this in like a network where the end state vision of this is like this is a maximally decentralized permissionless like. We, you know, the the ownership of Soul and the network is like completely decentralized. It's not just like you know a handful of like larger parties who control large amounts of stake and kind of like can drive the messaging a lot. Um, I, I think where it is today, like it's sustainable enough. Like there's enough, like it's a small enough community where like there is meaningful cohesion of like you can kind of rally around something like this. I don't think that this is sustainable if you like look on a multi-year time horizon of like where you kind of want Solana to go. Of like you know you don't have you know, the foundation delegation program or like large investors that like hold the large, large amount. And like, there's, ve- you know, there's a bunch of different validator clients. And, you know, we don't even know who a bunch of the validators are. In that world, I think it's like pretty ho- difficult to start to rally around this. Um, and that's why, like, I think that Ethereum's decision was like probably rational for like where they were. Like, the, like it, w- it was like a very different social system at the time. And like now compared to Solana still, where it is more challenging in that situation like to actually have like social cohesion around this particularly for stuff that like ethereum is not willing to trade off on um so it is difficult um i mean like that is also going to influence a lot of people's views on this is like there is a level of like oh like if this does work on solana does that mean like ethereum screwed up on hindsight like that is going to be in people's heads um and so like that is going to color people's opinions like like what they think is right or wrong and what's going to work here um so like in general, I do think this makes sense for like more opinionated environments. Um, I, I don't think it's probably like a super stable long run solution for something like Solana. Like this works if you've like got a roll up and you got a couple sequencers and you know who they are and like it's fine. Um, it probably doesn't work in a system like this where you want like thousands of validators and decentralized governance and all of that in the longer run. I think um, I think like, I saw it's totally mentioned maybe kind of a hybrid solution as well. Like you can't purely be social, but it can probably be somewhat mixed in that. As a DAP, you can, with the help of RPCs, let's say, figure out which validators are sandwiching you. And when you are sending transactions, you can kind of choose to not send to to those people. Um, and so, like maybe some sort of like rough efficiency or reputation metric that you can use for routing transactions. The people who are sensitive will will use uh, the protected ones. The ones who aren't won't. That could be interesting, it, or at least it's a first good approach. I think that could be interesting. Um, one thing I'm curious, just from a place of ignorance, is how MEV would work on L2s and rollups and sequencers and shared sequencers and all this stuff. What What is kind of the, because like obviously due to, um, 
Actually, there's kind of two questions here because I'm not even quite sure if some L2s are actually going to decentralize sequencer in the first place. Like, it seems like some just won't. And then some obviously are interested in it. What is like the overall like bird's eye view of MEV on rollups currently and what that landscape is today? There's a mix of stated plans and current state and like there's big differences between them. So fundamentally, particularly based on what a lot of them want their future plans to be, there should be no fundamental difference between an L1 and an L2 or rollup or whatever. Um, Because a lot of them say like, oh yeah, we want to decentralize the sequencer. We're going to have like 75 sequencers. It's going to look like a validator set, blah, blah, blah. Um, In that scenario, I mean, like it it looks like any other chain and like then it's kind of the same situation. Um, In practice, what most of them do today is like they're running a centralized sequencer that like does first come first serve and like you just kind of trust them. And like, yeah, they could screw with you if they want to. but they're not going to because like they are the centralized party who's kind of behind this thing and like their reputation, the value that they're getting from this like far outweighs like, you know, getting some sandwich profits. Um, I like actually think that is probably directionally where a lot more of this will go um, than people expect. Um, There starts to become like, like, in general, I, like I am very frequently a fa- and like I tweeted about this, like actually like kind of at the abstract at the time, but like I'm I'm generally a fan of systems that make like very strong trade offs and then just kind of like lean into that and understand like, OK, like we are obviously making a trade off in this regard and then like pursue that to the fullest extent. Um, most systems that try to like, oh, we're going to solve all the problems, we're going to perfectly decentralize, it's going to completely solve MEV and we're also going to be completely decentralized and permissionless, like like, like there is no perfect solution to this. Um, so my inclination is that like I actually think that a lot of rollups will start to gravitate closer towards the centralized, decentralized mix of like, yeah, we do just have a fully centralized operator. And like we accept that that like that is a trade-off of like there is a centralized operator who is responsible for the ordering and execution of this chain. Um, like they're the one who decides like what is the construction of the box, what is the ordering of transactions. And then we have fully decentralized, like after the fact verification, self-custodial, all of that. Um, but fundamentally at the end of the day, like a centralized sequencer is always going to give you like the best MBV protection, quote unquote, of like, yeah, you just like, you trust, you know, if Coinbase is running a sequencer, they're not going to go front run their customers for the same reason. I trust them not to like screw me when I trade on Coinbase, the exchange, um, like they're not going to do that. And they're always going to be able to offer the best product in that circumstance of like, yeah, just like jack up the hardware requirements. Cause like, who cares? It's a centralized sequencer. Um, you can offer just like instant latency. Like you don't even need like a few hundred millisecond block times, like just be instant. Um, I, I think it's always going to be inherently super, super hard to compete with that. And I think you're going to see people lean more into that direction and realize that like, this is kind of a big fundamental reason in my mind, why you do a roll up in the first place is like that just this real time guarantee of like who is sequencing and ordering the transactions is like a pretty different role than, okay, we're just like signing off on the data after the fact and then like everyone can go verify that. Like the first one is the MBV one that like is always going to have all these centralizing problems that like we see in practice, whether it's Ethereum and Solana, and you go down the road of like, where does most of it lead is like, you end up with some form of like permissioning usually to fix it is like, all right, we either like permission to set our fillers who are now the only ones who are executing this or we have like, we do a full block PBS and then it's like, all right, well, like we have a million validators, but like, you know, three different block builders are like building all the blocks. So it's just like, why don't we just like make them like make the blocks in the first place? And like, you see Ethereum PBS moving even more in that direction of like, all right, we outsource block production. And now you're raising like, oh, with execution tickets and stuff more in that direction. Like maybe we just outsource like proposing too. And it's like more of the testing role that you keep. Um, so I think it's going to keep moving this direction. Um, I, I think that you probably will see more and more rollups in the long run realize that like, it's a perfectly acceptable trade-off to like have like a fully centralized or like small set of sequencers. And then you just like completely like take advantage of that and lean into it. And like you understand it's a trade off and like, yeah, it simplifies the problem. It's like, it's taking a shortcut. Um, I do think a lot more people will do that in the long run. Like it, once you start having like, all right, we're a roll up and we're going to have a hundred different validators. Like you just go be an L1. Like, like there's no reason for like you to be like making this trade off in, in, in the first place then and like posting to some other delay or doing all that kind of stuff. Like usually that trade off is not going to make sense in my mind. Interesting. Okay. Um, actually, so talking about that, let's assume we have a centralized sequencer, right? And there's no MEV because it just protects you. Uh, I th- so, okay, I'm, I'm going to read Kyle, Kyle Samani's tweet that I quote tweeted you, and I believe you quote, quote tweeted it back. Uh, and, and the tweet is, there's a common trope that soul cannot capture value because gas fees are too low. This is nonsense. The primary value driver for asset ledgers, inclusive of L1, L2, L3, is MEV. Nothing else matters. What do you think? What do you think, Sean? I think that's definitely not true today. Um, there is like 
some reasonable argument that that is true in the longer run in like a quote unquote, like rational market that is like strictly looking at valuations. I think that is like very obviously not true today. Like no one is buying Tia or Sol or ETH or any of these things based on like a DCF of their future expected like MEV or fees. Like, like I can promise you no one's doing that. You'll get like very different numbers and be very sad with it if you try to do that. Um, in the long run, there's like a fair argument of that. Um, I also don't think that's even it, like it's also interesting to me that he will argue that often for Solano when there is like also the argument that like he will generally make is that like it is reasonable that Sol becomes like a money like asset. Um, even though Tolly will obviously say like no, it's just spam. But like a lot of people will argue like no, it can actually serve a money like function. And like obviously if you're valuing it on this kind of just like intangible, oh, it's like ETH, it's like Bitcoin, like people just want to use it. Like no one's valuing that based off of a cash flow. So the question is like what like what is the asset? Like how are people valuing it? It can just be valuable because like people want it as like a money like asset and like it has value. Um in reality, like in the long run in a more efficient market is most stuff can be priced that way. Like, no, probably not. And then there's like a reasonable argument for stuff like this. Like, all right, it's just like a cash flow business. Um, and, and that becomes particularly reasonable as you start to see potentially like more of these chains move towards this model over time of like, it is this kind of like hybrid, like centralized, decentralized product of like, you could just have some roll up with like a centralized sequencer and it's running, you know, some exchange or whatever. And like, it just like feels like Coinbase or whatever. Like you, like you don't like really know the difference. It doesn't even need to have a token or anything else. It's just like, how do they make money on it? Like they make money on fees, like the same way that Coinbase does today. Um, so I think there's like a reasonable argument that stuff starts to gravitate towards that over time. I don't think that's ever going to be true in practice of like, are people ever going to value ETH based on like a DCF of the MEV? Like, no, I, like I, I just don't really buy that as like an outcome. Um, cause clearly like, no, like that is not why anyone is interested in the, in the asset, like really in the first place. Um, so like, it's definitely important to understand like what, like what are the value flows going through these systems? But in practice, like no one's valuing these things based on a DCF today. Like you won't get any of the numbers that you see on any of these coins today. If you value like literally any of them on a DCF, like maybe one or two. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the worst part is when you do that in the heat of a bear market, you still don't get the numbers that you'd want to see that, that, to make any level of sense. But um, let's use this conversation on sequencers to kind of roll into the Denkun upgrade that's coming for Ethereum. So uh, Denkun brings a couple things to Ethereum. Many of them are quite important, but we'll focus in on EIP 4844, which brings blobs to block space, right? So uh, re just as a refresher here, blobs are like a sidecar on a block uh, where a blob itself is just an arbitrary data structure, arbitrary data structure that uh, rollups will post their data to. So they post all of their transaction data or state diffs uh, into this blob, and it has its own pricing mechanism. So uh, in regular transactions, we'll follow the same EIP one five five nine curve, um, where there's a base fee that changes based on demand. Uh, so it's the same concept, just taken into a, a separate fee market. So you now have like two fee markets: one for transacting um, typical DeFi transactions, NFT transactions, sending someone ETH. That's all in the original market. We just have a separate market specifically for rollups to post their data to. Uh, however, this is also a permissionless market, so Theoretically, anybody could participate and um, purchase blob space. Uh, so, John, I want to throw it over to you. We talked about this last week a little bit, um, just on the idea that I know the Optimism team, they put out like an analysis using prediction markets uh, to kind of say, here's a potential outcome. Uh, of course, those prediction markets didn't have a ton of liquidity, which is a huge like disclaimer around that analysis, which I think they're aware of. But um, I want to get your take on where you think this list will end up with the Im meaning the impact that it will have on L2 transaction fees. Uh, like, and I, I, again, I want to caveat this with we're making the prediction the day before the upgrade goes live, uh, knowing that the episode airs the day after. We'll re record it tomorrow if I get it wrong. It's fine. Uh, like, I, I like everyone is completely guessing on this. My like very I think reasonable intuition is like, yeah, like when the thing launches, you're going to see gas prices drop a lot for some reasonable period of time. Um, and then you're going to start to see them like creep back up on like the market's going to adjust to kind of the new capacity. Like, does that take one month, two months, six months? Like, honestly, I have no clue whatsoever. Um, could be choppy along the way, like kind of unclear. Um, my, like my general view on it is that, at least from a higher level, is that it will be helpful. It will, on the margin, reduce gas fees relative to what they would have been. I don't think 
it approaches anything that is like of enough significance that it like is going to meaningfully change the architecture or the paths of like most of these other chains. Um, it, like it's not going to be the type of thing that moves the needle of like, hey, if I'm spinning up a new chain today that like wants to be this ultra high performant new chain that's, you know, it's basically free to use, blah, 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 is competitive with Solana. Ethereum with Forge for Four is still not going to be the thing that you pick. Um, you are still going to opt for something like Celestia, maybe like something like EigenDA when it goes live. It's still going to be like, it, it is a multiple improvement over like what the current status is. It's not something that's going to like put you on par with like being com cost competitive transaction uh, throughput competitive with like something like Solana, particularly as like you're thinking about spinning up these new chains. You're still going to go use the newer, meaningfully cheaper thing. Um, I, I think it is like a meaningful benefit, particularly for the large high value rollups that like aren't going to leave Ethereum and are on Ethereum. Like the chains like Optimism Mainnet, like Arbitrum One, like those types of chains, like this makes a big difference to them of like, you know, when things are bad, like users could have to pay a few dollars to go swap on one of these chains. And like this will meaningfully help with that. I don't think it is something that is like of enough significance that like it really shifts the playing field at like a higher level on crypto of like, oh, like now all these chains are just going to go be Ethereum rollups now. And like, there's no need for all these other, you know, alt DA, you know, it's, it's not an alt, it's like, it's not an alt DA killer or an alt L1 killer, like those kinds of things. Um, it'll be helpful to the current chains, but I, I don't think it's like this radical change that's going to like meaningfully like shift the playing field. Yeah, and actually, uh, one of my favorite interactions about this was was yours with uh, Vance, and uh, he, he said uh, he said there'll likely be a hundred to one thousand rollups in the next year or so. One thousand rollups each paying ETH stakers one to ten ETH per day is where this ends up. And then you were like, the four eight four four spec target zero point three seven five mega megabytes per block will support roughly a hundred TPS combined across all rollups. LOL. <laughs> and uh, um. First of all, um, so what I'm actually the, the most interested in is because I, I think like the net difference probably won't be too noticeable after the market demand picks up a little bit. Uh, I, I made a tweet that I got trolled for, which is like, OK, so you're telling me that the uh, the, the, the fees um, uh, uh, will go down, but then ETH will go up and then the demand will go up. And so what's going to be the difference? And I got trolled for this, but that's not new. Um so my question actually is because I believe you're an investor in Celestia, right? Uh, in 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 Tia? No, you're not. Okay, so I'm a, I'm a like I'm a personal angel that like I'd angeled into it a couple of years ago, but DB is not an investor now. Okay, okay. So what I'm actually the most uh, curious about, just again from a place of ignorance, is because there's also Eigen Eigen DA now, and or there will be Eigen DA, and there's Celestia DA. What is kind of like what are roll up teams thinking of, of of how to pick between these two things? Um, just, I'm kind of like pretty confused because again, like, I don't think 4844 is going to do anything that crazy. Yeah. I, I mean, the very practical consideration from teams so far has been like, I can DA is still a theoretical thing. It's not like actually a live thing. If you are someone like Eclipse or Avo or Manta or any of the other chains that are like starting to use a uh, Celestia now. Like when they're building this thing, like they, they needed the first viable thing that is a good choice. And like that was the primary decision factor is that like, yeah, so SD is going to be live like at least six months, probably more than that, like before I can DA, like they launched them at like end of October or something like that. So quite frankly, that was like the main decision point, I think, in practice, like for most of these teams so far. Um, it's just like, yeah, like the thing is live. We understand like it's stable. It works. Um, and that is going to be a moat for like some meaningful amount of time in my mind, because I mean, like we'll see when I can DA launches at some point later this year, presumably. And then people will want to see the same thing of like, all right, like it's live, like it seems to be working well, like some other people are using it. Um, and then you get to a point where like, okay, both of these things are live and competitive with each other. Like both work reasonably well, they're both reliable, they're both cheap, et cetera. Um, I, I don't think that there is going to be like these gigantic moats between these types of DA layers and like the super long term. Um, I, the, the big question is going to be is like there was clearly a gigantic demand for people to come off of Ethereum and go to something like Celestia for those first like few orders of a magnitude of cost reduction, like going from a dollar per swap to like a fraction of a penny per swap matters a lot. Um, but is it going to be a moat if like 
uh, or or is it going to be like a meaningful differentiating factor rather like if you know if my chain is on celestia and like that costs me you know a tenth of a penny and then eigen da shows me the math of like oh but you can get like a thousandth of a penny if you go use eigen da is that going to matter to most people um am i not for some use cases that may be a meaningful factor um it's also a guess of like what like what are the orders of magnitude difference between those things going to be and like where does that stay over time? So like in practice, I my general assumption is both of them and others are going to be like in the same orders of magnitude of like really cheap. And from the user perspective, they will just be really cheap. And like whether those orders of magnitude make a difference between them, probably not for most things. And then it's just going to come down to quite frankly, like what is the brand that you want to be associated with? Like what is like a reliable thing that you trust? Um, and like that, that is the main thing that quite frankly, Celestia has going for it right now. My mind is that of just like, that is like the assumed and safe and market understood thing now of like, Hey, we're going to swap out our DA and we're going to go use Celestia. Like that is a thing that users in the market understand. It's like, this is like a safe and normal and reliable thing to go use. It's not like someone who's trying to say like, Oh yeah, like I'm going to go use this like weird committee that like you've never heard of before. And like, it works this way, but like, trust me, it's safe. Like that, like that is still something that like, you're not going to want to sell to most people. Um, so just really just the the brand and the reliability around it is like going to be a moat for at least some period of time. But what happens when you have like three or four that like are super reliable and like well understood by the market? I, I don't think there's going to be like a gigantic moat between or one or the other probably over time um, as you start to play that out further and further. So I've been poking around the the cost of DA for rollups data quite a bit now. And I got some numbers. So I'll use Arbitrum as an example here, and let's just see. So over the course of its lifetime, it's posted it's about 63, almost 64,000 megabytes of data to Ethereum, and it's paid $79 million to do so. Uh, so that comes out to about a $1,250 uh, per megabyte of data. Celestia charges $0.20 cents per megabyte of data. So that is a multiple orders of magnitude difference there. Um, and I did some napkin math on the optimism numbers we referenced earlier. Uh, that's their prediction, again, using prediction markets, maybe not the best idea, but uh, for what it's worth, that was the cheapest outcome for of any, any of the predictions we've really seen for 4844. Uh, that was coming out to about 13 or so dollars per megabyte. Um, and again, Celestia's 20 cents, EigenDA is uh, expect it to be slightly cheaper than Celestia. I do agree with your take, John. That's like, you know, once you're at that 20 cent mark, like, do you care if it gets cut in half to 10? Um, it seems like the answer is, you know, intuitively no, but there's a good example we have in production here is um, Manta Network right now is actually paying about $2 per megabyte of data. They're simply overpaying. Celestia uses a first first price auction fee mechanism uh, and that enables first, uh, or excuse me, that enables overpaying, like there's just nothing that protects against that. Uh, not the best fee mechanism, but really just like a non-issue for Celestia right now. And like Manta just needs to pay less and they'll still get in the block, uh, but they're not. And like the reality is they just don't care because it doesn't make a huge difference in their bottom line. Uh, so yes, I'm sure they'll fix that in the future, but uh, that's kind of a, a point that we have in production that kind of lends that to being true. It's like, you know, yeah, I started here, it's effort to change and I'm really not even gonna end up saving money. Like, why would I? Have you heard of either of you, I guess, really heard if there's um, any like anyone that's like, yeah, we're rolling out on day one, because the other piece to this is you have to if you're going to post data to a blob, you must consume the whole blob. Like even if you only like uh, the, the maximum amount of data per blob is 0 0.125 megabytes. And if you only need to point post half of that or a third of that or a tenth of that, you got to buy the whole blob. Um, and so for. Some rollups, I'm curious if we see some sort of like shared blob strategy. That sounds incredibly complex um, and even more engineering work that would need to go into that. So that's, I guess, a two-piece question here is, have you heard of any blob sh sharing strategies and what, like, how quickly do you think teams will roll out adoption of 4844 blobs? Uh, so as far as 4844, um, I would strongly expect most slash all major L2s to adopt it like very, very quickly. Like they've known this is coming for of quite a long time. I don't know the exact timelines for all of them. I'd be quite surprised if any of them have any like meaningful delay um, beyond the upgrade. Um, so that's my strong guess there. As far as the blob sharing, yeah, it, it's it's like it's an annoying quirk with it. Um, in practice, it doesn't matter a ton, particularly for mostly the larger rollups of like, yeah, you just like you wait a little bit and then you build up enough that like you have a full blob and then you post it. Um, it, like in practice, a lot of these rollups are already playing kind of these like timing games to some degree 
of like Arbitrum does this with their sequencer, for example, of like, all right, gas prices are really high. Like we'll wait a little bit longer to post a batch based on like we determine this that, you know, it's more li- like it's likely to save us some cost. And then like, oh, gas prices are low. Like we'll post a bunch more of them now, like a little bit faster. Um, so I, I think it's going to be like reasonable for people to do similar stuff like this. Um, I, like I have heard some people working around strategies for sharing blobs and like in theory it is more efficient. I just don't think it's probably a pressing need for like most of them, particularly particularly at least for the large rollups. For the small rollups that just like have small transaction volume, um, that is something that like actually would matter more for them. Um, and then you can imagine different types of aggregation layers, whether that's like posting through an L2 from an L3 or like having different forms of shared sequencers um, that are like aggregating the data from a bunch of them and posting them together in like the most efficient way. Um, so it, it's going to become relevant, for, particularly for like probably longer tail stuff that like can't just like fill up a blob pretty quickly. Um, but for for the larger chains, especially, it's like it's within the reasonable amount of like they'll, they'll fill it up like, within a pretty short period of time. And like they're not like post, they don't need to post every block anyway. John, you recently tweeted uh, something I found interesting, uh, and I commented misaligned uh, to it, but uh, I, th- I thought it was, a, as a, as a, it was an interesting tweet, um, which I don't think Arbitrum, I think this is Arbitrum, right, agreed with. Um, and yeah, it was L2 is aggressively pushing L3s is a strategic business move rather than a scaling one, and one that Ethereum L1 should be cautious of the power dynamics. What does this mean? What did he mean by this? First, I guess I'll explain what are we even talking about when we say like L1s, L2s, L3s, because like I think that it's like actually valuable. Um, I mean, like all we're really talking about is like in practice, like where do you have a contract that you're like quote unquote settling to that like you're determining your fork choice off of? Like if you're, you know, optimism or base right now, like they are L2s in the sense that like their contract that like they're looking to that like, you know, hey, we're like we're looking to Ethereum for like our fork choice. Like you can just have a chain that deploys that same type of contract. Like you deploy it on top of an L2 and like now you're quote unquote an L3 and like you're like settling down to the L2 and then they settle down to Ethereum. Um, so like the, the thing that like has annoyed me with some of that conversation is a lot of people will tend to imply that like, oh, this is an amazing scalability thing. And like L3s are going to be like a million times cheaper. And like this solves all the problems. Like we need L3s. Like this is what you need for like customized block space and like high scale and all of those things. Um, There is no fundamental difference between an L1 or an L2 or an L3. Like it makes absolutely no difference in this regard. Um, If you are an L2, you can post to some other DA layer if you want. You can aggregate proofs with other chains so that you, such that you amortize your proof costs together. Um, there, there is no fundamental difference in this regard for scalability um, from whether you're in L2, in L3, whatever. Like e- Either one can use whatever DA layer you want, and you could do whatever you want for settlement costs. You can post to some other chain. It doesn't matter. Um, so that's the kind of like fundamental side, the like in practice benefit of them, I would say is like, and this is kind of the same thing that I had written in the like L1 versus L2s, modular versus monolithic, app specific versus general purpose thing I'd written is like, the main thing I honestly view like between L1 and L2 is like, it's like honestly mostly a UX thing, quite frankly. Um, And that is the situation where like in practice today, I think it actually does make sense to have L3s in some of these cases is like, what is the real benefit for an L2 in like most of these cases? is it is just like a simple and understandable mapping for the user of like, all right, this is an Ethereum extension. Like, yeah, the native asset is ETH. Like, this is the single bridge. We don't have like 20 different wrapped versions of this thing. Like, you don't have to like understand all these like different complicated things with it. It's just like, it just feels and looks like Ethereum. Like, and the users will uh, supposedly just like generally come through there. Like that is the user base that you're trying to tap into. Um, so by extension of that, if you like are an app chain where all of your target users are onboarded through base, it actually makes sense for you to just like directly settle to base because like all you're doing is like you're giving yourself an opinionated bridge natively to base. If you think that all of your users are going to come from base and they're not coming from like Ethereum L1 or some other rollup or whatever, it makes sense for you to just like tie your chain to base because it's like it's the simplest bridging experience that gives you like instant bridging up. So like it makes sense, um, but it's, it's not like a fundamental scaling thing. Like you, like you can have an L2 that's cheap. Um, like you can do, you can make all the same customizable decisions. Um, so. That is the situation where, like, it makes sense today. Um, In particular, the, like, the main thing that would, like, remove a lot of the need for this 
um, is like, I think you guys actually just recorded a pod um, with Brendan um, for Polygon and like talking about like ag layer is like the main thing that removes the need for this is once you have really good ZK aggregation across all of these chains. So I kind of hand waved over that at the beginning of the answer is like that, that like theoretically solves these problems that like doesn't really exist in practice quite yet today. Like that should be in like the pretty near term is that like that would mostly solve a lot of these problems. It's like, all right, we can just aggregate the proofs across these chains. And then it doesn't matter if as long as we're sharing a bridge, bridge contract, whether I'm going from this L2 to that L2 or this L3 to the L2 on it, like it shouldn't make a difference um, in practice that doesn't actually exist today. Like these chains in the super chain in particular, like they don't have proofs at all. Um, so like having the data bridge that like settles to it and you could just bridge to it instantly, like that actually is just a benefit for it. Um, th the reason I was saying to like, to like be careful in some sense is you can imagine playing this out to the very strong extreme of like, okay, if, you know, let's say it's base or Arbitrum or whatever, like, let's say everything is an L3 on top of them. Like, this is where all the users are coming from. This is where all the native assets are coming from. Like. Once you play this out to the extreme, it's like become some degree of like, all right, like what do we like actually need Ethereum for at the end of the day? And that like to some extent of like, like why do they need their bridge contract there? Like why do they need to post their data there? Like all of these customers are there for base. They're not there for Ethereum, um, which again is like a totally rational thing for all these chains to do. It's perfectly understandable. Um, but I, I do think that we at least need to realize like there's a very strong business reason that these L2s are pushing L3s. It's because it's very valuable for them. Like they own the customer, they own the relationships, like they are the funnel to all of those chains. Like that is a valuable thing to own. Um, there's a reason that it, it has always been free and permissionless to launch an Arbitrum Orbit L3 that settles to an Arbitrum L2. But if you want to fork it as your own L2 or settle to another L2, you cannot do that permissionlessly and for free. Like you do need governance permission or pay. Um, so like th there's a business motivation here, which is totally fine. Um, I, I just want to make sure that like everybody acknowledges like there's obviously a business motivation here. It is a smart strategic move. It can be good UX, um, but it's not this like inherent like, oh, it solves all the scalability problems. Like L3s are cheaper. Like, you know, we don't need L1s anymore. Um, so yeah, like th that was kind of the uh, kind of the point behind it. Yeah, that's that's a really valuable perspective. I, I think people do definitely most certainly need to understand understand and as base in particular, I, I do agree it makes the most sense for just given Coinbase will put users on base. And if everybody like you as a builder, that's you want to be in front of the users in the easiest way possible. And that's probably gonna be one of them. So um that I, I think base is probably one rare instance where it does indeed make sense. You brought up the Polygon episode, and yes, Jonas from the future, the the Polygon episode will air the Tuesday following this episode's release. And in that episode, we, we touched on the aggregation layer, of course. It's a huge uh, technical advancement for the industry, specifically Ethereum. And you also mentioned there that, you know, you need some of these requirements, like the same bridge contract. Um, Polygon is not the only people that is building something that looks like an aggregation layer. Everybody's spending a shit ton of money investing in the latest and greatest on the ZK side of things. That's like, you know, billions of dollars being poured into this stuff. And all of the incentives are for their solutions to win, their ZK circuits to be the ones that everybody else is trusting and plugging into. If you could like rewind everything, and of course, this is not how Ethereum you know existed. It had to do a lot of like the pulling back the curtain for everybody else in the industry. And um, you know, now it's kind of got this situation where it has all of these different bridge contracts to all of these aggregation layers to like this networks of, of chains. So you get like what's called constellations and going in transactions between chains within the same constellations, super straightforward. That's what the aggregation layer is for. Going between the constellations themselves is still like this frictionful. Um, challenge. And so in a perfect world, you'd kind of have one bridge contract, one aggregation layer, one, cert one set of ZK circuits. But the reality is like, that's just not how things unfolded. Do you think that that plays like a negative impact into th Ethereum's success or growth story here? I don't know that it has like actually meaningfully hurt Ethereum um, either in the past or going forward, like at, le at least in practice. Um, like, I know, I know the fragmentation and the UX and all those things. Like, I mean, like that is the main reason why Solana has done very well lately um, and has gotten a lot of people interested because, yeah, yeah, this like stuff is like very difficult and annoying to use. Um, that being said, there is a tremendous benefit in Ethereum that has happened over its life cycle of having these kind of diverse ecosystems built on top of it and not just having, oh, yeah, it is like everything is a polygon uh, ag layer chain and like we all settled to the same bridge contract like it's been incredibly beneficial 
um, to have the incentive for all of these teams to keep building on top of Ethereum and just keep incrementally pushing the ball forward. Like, yeah, in practice, that means a bunch of fragmentation, but it also means that all of these other teams are competing against each other and like they do have to get better at what they're doing and they do have to keep you know building a better thing because of that. I do think that is the better solution over the long run. I, I don't think there's ever going to be something that is like super opinionated that would ever get anyone to opt into. Um, and I, I think that is like a general part of the benefit of like Aglayer is that it tries to be minimally opinionated. It's not try, like it's not like something like a shared sequencer is like I would generally consider like a more opinionated thing that you kind of put on top of it. Um, like you can use a shared sequencer with this or you could like not like you can control whatever sequencing rules you want, whatever DA layer you want. Um, so having that flexibility is important. Um, so like putting everything together would have been, you know, it would have been nice from a UX perspective. I don't think if for like an ecosystem growth perspective overall, um, like it actually would have been good. Um, like I, I think having all these different like ecosystems kind of built on top, each kind of pushing forward has been helpful. Um, you probably see in the longer term more coalescing around like what is what are some of the winning and better standards? Like, what are the simple, minimal things that, like, we can all agree on or kind of, like, that are helpful standards? Um, I, I think you will generally move towards that direction naturally over time. And, like, the UX will only get better. And, like, the, the unification will only get better. Um, it will be, like, a long and painful process. But, like, I, I do think that in the long run, like, that is probably the more valuable path for Ethereum. Like, it was never going to be able to compete on, like, Unity and, like, the simplified UX versus something like Solana on the, on the same time scale. Like, this is just never going to happen. Like, th like that is the trade-off that you're making. Like, lean into it. Let all the ecosystems build the cool stuff on top of you. Like, it was never going to be as good as, like, using one chain. Well, so actually, what I want to do now is get some general commentary. Uh, because you mentioned Solana, but there's actually other L1s now. Um, yeah, there, there are other L1s now. Uh, Sui Aptos, say... Um, Monad coming out soon, uh, and then there's a lot of L2s, L3s, um, Sovereign rollups, a bunch of shit, basically. And uh, I'm curious how you think about holistically the space. If you uh, were to just try to reason about what trends you think will emerge in the next two years or something like that, like any sort of prediction, um, do you think the L1s kind of like Sui and Aptos make more of a splash? Or do you think ZK tech improves very fast? Or this abstraction happens faster than people think? Um, what are your just general thoughts? Like if I'm just, if you're talking to somebody and you're trying to give them a boot camp to like starting DBA as like an analyst or something, how do you describe the industry currently? On a two year time span, I, actually don't think it's going to look crazy different than it does today. I think we're going to see a similar mix of all of these approaches. Um, like the Alt L1 rotation and getting a newer, faster L1, it's not going to go away. It's going to be the same thing in two years. Um, if for nothing else, quite frankly, because of the investment incentives there, of like that is still going to be in my mind, like for most things, like the simplest and most attractive investment for people in size of like they're excited about an ecosystem. What do you do? You go by Soul or you go by ETH. Like that that is still just like a useful thing. And I like I don't think that's gonna go away. Like people are gonna get excited about it. And that means there's an incentive to go build those things. Um therefore like they will probably still exist and like people will keep building them. Um and they are getting faster and better every single time. So great. Like they're pushing the tech forward um every single time. So I, I don't expect that to go away at all. Um I don't think you'll see a million general purpose, super decentralized uh, of these all ones that are like actually really valuable and have any meaningful community around them. I do think that like stays in the like handful of them that we can like reason about, you know, maybe it is Solana and like uh, three or four others, like what, whatever that number is. Um, I, I, I do expect that. Um, like Solana is like not going to go away. And like there will be similar chains like that that are like relevant, that are relevant and have like this big general purpose um, execution and community around it. Um, and then I do think that there will be like a ton of rollups and L2s um, and just like more, more app. I don't want to, I don't even want to say app specific, but like there will be, because I think that's like honestly in half the time, like they're really general purpose, not app specific. Um, but there will be a lot of chains and they will start to, and they will look more like this like L2 ish model. It's just that like the lines on that are also going to blur of like, like, what, like, what is this thing of like, 
all right, like it's primarily using ETH assets, but like it's using this other DA and like maybe it's like using restaking to secure the thing. And like maybe it's maybe it's not using DA. Like I, I think that you're going to see all different mixes of this and everything is like kind of going to blend together. Like I think most major assets are going to start to look very similar in that regard of like you're going to have a major asset that is like used for some form of restaking um, that is going to be the staking kind of center of this ecosystem. Like you're probably going to see the same with Solana um, that you see with Ethereum of like people will start using sole restaking and like there'll be an incentive to have like I like I know that you've also been more positive and like it might make sense to have more L2s on top of Solana. I think that will probably happen in over the next few years like people will build those because like it actually does make sense to um you'll probably see the same thing with celestia of like sure why not like build celestia restaking like i think a lot of these major assets are going to converge on the kind of similar ecosystem type model um but yeah in two years i actually don't think it'll look crazy different i think it will look similar just more developed of you'll have a handful of these integrated chains that are still like super super popular that people are excited about but you'll also have like a million different chains um and like most of them won't be relevant like most of them won't like people won't care about them at all. Um, but you will still have that just like very strong mix of architectures in my mind. Um, that's a good thing. I, like, I don't think we need to all coalesce around like this, this exact same standard for everything, particularly in the next couple of years. One, um, one thing I want to touch on quickly is uh, your recent investment into Eclipse, which is an SVM rollup, which I believe uses Celestia for DA and settles on Ethereum. And I think probably... There's some plans for changing that DA later, but you know, for for the time being, it's it's that that's what it is. One one criticism I heard of this was that the the overwhelming bottleneck is obviously DA, and so why do you also need to make the execution environment SVM? What do you what do you think about this criticism? So the bottleneck depends on the different chains. Um, and like you can actually have the different bottlenecks at different times. I, I would say in practice for most Ethereum rollups, particularly in aggregate, like DA is the bottleneck for them. Um, and that, I mean, that's why Eclipse will not use like Ethereum DA, because a lot of this would go to waste if you were still using Ethereum DA. You need to remove that as the bottleneck for them. And like that in practice is the bottleneck for a lot of them, at least on your steady state costs, um, is that. Um, so they will remove that. And that sets your baseline back to like, OK, very cheap now for Celestia. Um, and then you could, all right, like, like, let's juice up the execution environment, like bump up the gas limits on this thing. And like, let's see where it goes. Um, you do eventually potentially end up on the same fundamental limit, depending on how big Celestia blocks get though, of like maybe Celestia blocks are eight megabytes. Um, but over that time period, like, you know, Eclipse keeps bumping up the hardware requirements and they need 10 megabytes, like over that same, same time period. Now, like now that is the bottleneck again. Um, so it, like, it's going to be a moving goalpost based on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, like th that is why Eclipse and like most of these other new chains in my mind, like they just won't use Ethereum DA, um, because it's not cost competitive. Um, and so like, you need to think about the different bottlenecks kind of at the different times, because there are other times where, uh, Ethereum worlds will get constrained by their own execution, um, where you'll see like, you know, gas prices on Arbitrum will get really high, but like they won't get high on Optimism. And it's because of like they have some finite gas limit on Arbitrum um, and like everyone wants to do, you know, an airdrop or some mint or whatever. Um, and that's just like bound by that own execution environment and not just like the DA of the chain underneath. Um, so it depends on the different like situations. Um, but yeah, I mean, like you definitely have to address both bottlenecks, like if you want to be super performant. So Neil had a tweet that I thought was hilarious, and it says Eclipse will push the hardware requirements of the SVM to laughable extremes, to levels that would make a Solana L1 validator gawk. This is only possible by virtue of our small sequencer set. I'm curious to get your thoughts around this. It, it, it really does seem like they're, uh, we kind of alluded to this earl earlier, honestly, is like, you know, own the fact that you have a small sequencer set and max that thing out. It, uh, just give us a little more insight onto how you think about this in the context of Eclipse. Yeah, I, like th this is my general view of if you want to be these ultra high performance chains, I think that is the way that most of these chains and these rollups will go if this is what they're trying to go after is this like super high performance market. Um, and that, that is what like Eclipse clearly wants to do. So like, like why not increase the hardware requirements like arbitrarily? Like th there's a very good argument that you should already do it on Solana today or at some point in the near term. But like you can be even far less cautious if you're just running this centralized thing by yourself. Like, yeah, like raise it higher. Like we're running it like we like we know what it costs. It's fine. 
Um, and yeah, if you get problems with it, like maybe you get a liveness failure. Uh, like, I don't know. I don't know. It's fine. Like that, it's going to happen to all of these chains. Um, like you should just be pushing the limits on all of these things much, much further. Um, once you're making this trade off in the first place, I think that's what, you know, directionally makes sense for them to do. If fire dancer is way better, like when that comes out, sure. Just run that instead. Like don't even run both clients. Um, I, I think you'll see other chains start to do this over too. Like chains like Mega ETH, um, like the same thing. If like you want to be the super high performance L2, like for the AV, AVM side for them, like, yeah, like you're going to want a much, much beefier sequencer. Um, like, like I think that is going to be in practice a trade off that is like worth making um, for these types of chains. If you want to be the most performant, like that, like that is the trade off that you're going to make. They're not trying to have a million validators. Like there's no reason to. Like this is the whole point of getting the. Uh, data availability sampling improves is like it lets you jack this up so take advantage of the trade-off john what do you think about meme coins uh i like i like i i i definitely just don't want to be at one of the vcs who's like writing the thought pieces on vcs uh on meme coins which is honestly most of the reason why i like don't write about them at all um like i love them um like they're great like I like I own meme coins personally. I mean, like it's it's not something that we do in the fund. Um, it, it's like, but like they're fun. Like th- like this is what crypto is in large part. Um, and like that's fine, particularly today. Like realistically, all of the people who are still here today are the like early people who are nerds and just like like using all this shit. Like like stop taking yourself so seriously and just like getting annoyed at the people who are trading meme coins. Like it's fine. Like like that is why a lot of these people are here is like this is like a fun industry to work in and like that's never going to go away um i like i i have no problem with that i and i do think that it is like for a lot of what the thought pieces are of like at least the general point like actually is valid of like we're going to move closer towards this like what is this thing priced on based on like attention and people like the thing and that's like perfectly valid um and like you're going to just see the stuff getting like weirder and weirder of like particularly like with all like the political ones for example i'm like i mean like half of them are like really a joke on solana but like uh, like the ones that are like the i don't know serious political meme coins like those are going to get really really valuable and like those are things that like the real world is going to notice and like that is not a trend that is going to go away you know if some of these political coins go to like billions of dollars of market caps like like that's not a trend that's going to go away in the future like this is obviously going to keep happening so like I don't know, like trying to ignore them or like downplay them or like say this is like a bad look for our industry or whatever is just like, I don't know, it's kind of ridiculous. Like this is like, this is why we build crypto in large part. It's like, yeah, it's permissionless. Like, go with it, go make whatever the hell you want. Like it's fun. Um, like, like that's that's my main take on it is like it's fun. And something that is like fun and people want is like that, like that is a huge value add for crypto. Like it's great. Like go play with your shit coins. Like it's, it's fun. Uh, Gambling is fun. There's no doubt about it. And I'll definitely, I'm with you. I mean, I think the the serious political uh, meme coins is, is quite funny, but you're right. Like, uh, like I, I, keeping my own personal politics completely out of this, I, I'm a pretty apolitical person, but I will take the over on Trump mentioning his, mentioning his own yeah. meme coin on TV. They're like, they're, come on, he's already talking about Bitcoin. I believe there's Trump co- uh, tokens in like the known Trump wallet from the NFT days. I Don't quote me on that. Uh, but I believe there is in like, He's the, he thinks he's cool because he has a meme, co- meme coin. There's just no doubt about it. But, um, Mark, you can go ahead if you got something. I was going to say, yeah, no, Trump launched his shit on Polygon and Melania launched his, her stuff on Solana. So there's a <laughs> there's a marriage uh, problems going on there. Uh, that's a great point as well. I mean, who knows? It's, I, there's just... It's, I agree with you, John. It's going to get more and more obvious. And like we've talked about social tokens last cycle and like here they are. They don't look exactly like what we thought they would look like, but this is them in real form trading today. Um, but maybe if we can close things out on Solano, because I think there's something interesting going on. Mert, you, uh, we, you know, we just had Vibu from Drip on the podcast. Uh, was that a couple weeks ago? And, you know, he was really talking about they're hitting some scaling issues. And now there's been some like more conversation around really what that is. Uh, and for some context here, you know, Solana is incredibly active right now. There's like over 8,500 SPL tokens getting created each day. Again, to John's point about all these meme coins, NFTs are, are kind of in that same category, just at a, a much smaller a uh, number relative to historical values. Um, uh, we've briefly talked about the the 
scheduler issues um, in the, on this pod before, but there's some network jitter and ultimately that creates this optimal strategy of spamming the network. Uh, so all those things to say, there is a ton of activity happening on mainnet right now. Some of it good, some of it not so good. Um, and this is impacting Drip's, Drip's ability to mint their NFTs for their users. And Vibu actually had a tweet the other day. It says, we have mints that have been pending for four to five days now. The current state is putting the best consumer app on Solana, the number one shot that has uh, to bring crypto to real people in our industry out to pasture. Um, and to be quite honest, it, I'd be like remiss not to mention that this is the exact problem that a lot of the modular folks are talking about is you need your own dedicated block space. So maybe you can just give us a little more background on the issues that uh, Drip and, and the team at, at Drip, uh, Vibu and the team at Drip are kind of experiencing right now, um, and like what activity on Solana that is kind of like creating that that negative externality for them. Yeah, it's a combination of things. One, one is the um, obviously the fees are super cheap, and the problem is the fee markets don't work properly currently. There's uh, they're quite buggy, and what I mean by that is. If, you know, Dan, me and you both send a transaction and I add a fee to mine and you don't add a fee to yours, there's not a guarantee that mine will beat yours every time. Okay. Uh, like it will be included. Like, there's no guarantee that mine will be included over yours. It's actually probabilistic because there's so much jitter in the scheduling. And this is kind of something inherent from building blocks continuously. I'm not going to get into the technicals, but like w once w when you start making things continuous, there's a lot of different edge cases that you don't really get with discrete. Um, and so that is to say what happens is, um, for like people obviously get frustrated because it's probabilistic, uh, but then people also end up overspending because like, they're like, wait a minute, my transaction didn't get in. I'm just going to increase the fee. But it's like, that's probably not why your transaction didn't get in, in the first place. It's probably because the jitter, like the, the random is actually just got the best of you. So you need to increase your sample size, which is something I have to tell people all the time as an RPC provider. Um, that's one issue. The other issue is that when block, blocks get full, um, some of the unstaked nodes start throttling connections in, or, or getting throttled by the leaders. And so the staked nodes actually get more priority. And then the other part of this is that there's shitcoin season. And shitcoin season means price movements, which means arbitrage, which means failed arbitrage, because that's how it works on Solana. And there is no mechanism to deter. If you now add the first thing that I mentioned of the fees not working properly, now your incentive is to spam the chain because the fees might not actually work. So spamming actually is a good strategy. And since it's a good strategy, people do it. And since they do it, the block space fills up. Um, and as a result, since this block space is shared, other people get affected. Um, and to be clear, there are fixes for this, like multiple, actually. There's a networking fix or, or, a, or a transaction scheduling fix coming out April 1st, that's going to fix probably most of the problems, I would say, uh, for the jitter at least. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's some discussion about reworking that working layer. Uh, that's what Fire Answer suggests and maybe some of the DeFi teams. And then Tolly has SIMD 110, which is about improving the economics such that people are uh, discouraged from spamming and they get like exponential fees for spamming. Um, so all those things are being worked on. Now, Drip's th case is that they, uh, like, Drip does an insane, so, okay, L let me kind of tackle the, uh, they use compression on Solana, which is, like, um, it lets you mint millions of NFTs for, like, a hundred, few hundred dollars. So, this is already just not doable on an L2. Like, it doesn't, this is due purely to the storage compute ratio that Solana has with the account model. Um, and you just could not do this anywhere else, Okay. Um, like millions of NFTs. And the problem is um, they are onboarding many more people while Solana is also getting congested. So there's a candle being burnt at both, end, both ends. And the official uh, compressed NFT minting API, and I called this out many, many months ago before it was released, lets you do it sequentially. So it's not a batch mint, okay? Like on Ethereum even, you can actually do batch mints, right? Because Ethereum obviously ran into these problems way back and uh, certain minting contracts let you batch mints. On Solana, you can't do that. It's one by one by one by one. And so that's a lot of transactions. And so now you're competing against Radium bots. So that's a recipe for disaster. And um, there's actually quite a few approaches to fix that. Like you can add a batch mint API instead to the contract. That would help a lot. Um, and you can, um, uh, you can use durable nonces which is what a team called Get uh, Code does, which, which have been on the show before. Um, so there's some uh, uh, solutions to it. 
I, the L2 approach to this wouldn't work because the state, like the, and Tolly says this all the time, the problem is like you, the, uh, uh, the, the state isolation, right? Like they get a, a certain part that they get to write to, right? And on a rollup, that's also shared basically, right? Unless it's a specific app chain, in which case your costs are probably not going to be as cheap as Solana in my view, because ultimately you have to use some DA. Um, and so I don't think any blockchain today will be able to handle what Drip is doing. Like they're doing some crazy stuff, millions of NFTs per day, every day. Uh, and uh, it's, 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 it's definitely challenging. I understand it's frustration, but um, there is a lot of, and this is what I said way earlier in the episode, which is that Solana is actually like insanely broken right now. <laughs> like it's, it's actually, it actually barely doesn't like it barely works. Uh, like you'll still be able to get your stuff through as a user, but like if you're a DAP, those uh, 400s and 500s in your data doc charts start adding up. You're like, what the hell is going on? And then people start blaming the RPC, but of course it's actually not the RPC. It's literally the network, um, which is actually goes back to John's point about like, you know, it's already broken. Okay. Like it, this is already priced and nobody gives a shit if it goes down at this point, honestly. Uh, or like you could probably just do what optimism did and just say you're going to do a <laughs> schedule maintenance. Uh, and just like, if not now, like, when are you going to do it? Like, are you going to do it when this total chain TVL is like 500 billion? Like, you're not going to be able to do it then. You'll literally get sued. Uh, but like, while the stakes are like Joe Bowden and, and Donald Trump, right? Like, I think it's probably okay to try. It's just interesting to see that, there, you know, we're still building out every scaling solution in every direction, whether that's scaling a, a single integrated chain uh, or pushing out into the more modular side of things. So it's probably a good place to wrap it, guys. Uh, this was an, another awesome episode. John, thank you so much for joining us. We'll put links to your Twitter. Uh, that's a must follow for anyone who made it this far in the episode. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I'll throw a link to DBA in there as well. Again, this is the fund that John co-founded. So thanks again for joining us. And, and Mert, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And we will see you guys next week. Ton of fun. Thanks, guys. 